Hey everyone, we're here with another interview with another very successful financial professional who's got a lot more experience uh, than myself. His name is uh, Chris Miller. Uh, he's a strategic partner who specializes in high-end tax mitigation, and I apologize for looking off to the side. I don't have my ideal setup here. I've got to check my notes. But uh, uh, Chris, uh, along with his business partner, has over 40 years of combined experience in this field. His business partner also happens to be his father, and I love the idea of family-owned businesses. So this is a good example of one. And we're excited to have Chris on the program with us today to talk about some of the things that he does. Chris, good to see you. How are you doing, my friend? Good morning. I'm doing well. It's good to be here. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Better now that I see you. Uh, so I absolutely love on your <laughs> LinkedIn profile, you have a great quote from Judge Learned Hand, and I quote, in America, there are two tax systems, one for the informed and one for the uninformed. Both are legal, unquote. What a, what a great line. Um, Chris, this, this seems to be what uh, a lot of people say, which is that if you rich people don't pay taxes, right? Um, and what they're doing is perfectly legal. So uh, you want to explain to me a little bit more about, about that quote and why it's on your LinkedIn profile? Sure. Um, kind of like you and I were... Uh, talking about off camera earlier, you know, we're, we're really educators. Um, you know, I think if you really care about your people, first and foremost, you want them to be properly educated because knowledge is power. Um, and you can't take that from somebody once they have it. So not to mention a client who fully understands what you do and how you do it and your why is going to be a better mouthpiece for what you do. So, um, but I'll, I'll give a, a simple analogy. Um, the first time you learned to play tic-tac-toe is like a child. Maybe you were like five years old. I think my son was five, four or five when we started to teach him how to play it. And at first, you know, he doesn't know the rules, so he loses, right? Mom or dad beats him because he doesn't know the rules. Once he understands and learns the rules, basically it's a cat's game every time. Unless you just make a mental mistake, uh, you tie every time. And why do I say that? Why do I use that analogy? Because in our society, the government and the big corporations make all the rules when it comes to you know, really the financial system. But let's just dumb it down to taxes specifically. Um, they make all the rules. If you don't know and understand those rules and the legal loopholes that have been put in place, you will get taken advantage of. Um, you know, obviously, we're talking more so about people who make a decent amount of money, but ultimately that's how it works. And if you can learn those rules or be educated on those rules through advisors like myself or reading the right books, um, then you can basically use those rules that have been put in place. The system has been put in place to your advantage. Like example, people say Trump pays no taxes. In reality, Trump pays more taxes than most people make in their lifetime, but he pays very little taxes because he has a team uh, tax advisors and tax attorneys that all they do is well, we, really what we do, but he's got a full-time team doing it. So, you know, like when he buys the, I think it was the golf course, but there was a cemetery attached to the golf course. And then he figured out because there was a cemetery, he could basically uh, zone it a certain way and it allows it to be all deductible, you know, that he doesn't mm -hmm. pay any taxes mm -hmm. on that. So right. it was like right. that. So, um, does someone, can, can someone obtain and have all the knowledge in, in the world? Highly unlikely. Um, and that's why there's people like me in place and the huge team that he has, because, you know, to have all the, the knowledge of taxes and entity structuring and codes and when things change and when things are going to sunset, knowing all that, that can be a part-time job. And so, mm -hmm. Mr. Smith is making half a million dollars a year as a CEO or whatever business owner. Does he have time to keep up to date with all that stuff? Probably not. And that's kind of yeah. where we come in. So. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, um, you used a word that I wouldn't use myself. Like you said loopholes, right? Usually I don't view it as loopholes because usually what we're doing with tax mitigation conceptually is very simple. Right. And there's always like a good 
justification for it. It's not we're taking advantage. We're, maybe we're avoiding being taken advantage of ourselves, right? Um, but what I like to say is I know you and I, uh, a lot of what we do is uh, specially designed forms of life insurance. Well, what does life insurance do? We're taking care of widows and orphans, right? We're taking care of widows and orphans. Well, of course, there should be tax mitigation involved in that, right? It would be incredibly unjust for a death benefit that goes to a poor widow and her four orphan children to be taxed, right? Like that would be absurd. So of course, um, when you think about it conceptually, what we're doing makes perfect sense, right? Um, so maybe that's a good segue into you maybe talking, you know, high level conceptual, what are some of the strategies that your team employs to help people uh, keep more of their own hard earned money? Um, good question. So first and foremost, loopholes is, um, not a, doesn't have to be a negative word, uh, negative phrase. It, it, that is the term that tax advisors and attorneys use. There are legal loopholes and there are loopholes that get you in an orange jumpsuit. Um, but the way it really works is the government creates a new tax code. Tax attorneys basically figure out the loopholes in that. That's not, it's not illegal. There's nothing wrong with that. That's what they're paid to do. But for every tax code that's created, there's usually some way to work around it or to create efficiencies tax wise is what I'll use. Um, but we're not talking offshore accounts. Um, we're not talking anything, you know, we don't even really do a conservation easements just because, um, Everybody I think I'm working with right now is dealing with an audit from years ago that their CPA recommended that, oh, do this conservation stuff. So, um, yeah, just to give a couple examples. Um, really what we specialize is in six to seven figure tax deductions. So we're more high level tax mitigations. Uh, our average clients making, you know, at least a million plus. Um, and then we also have clients that, you know, are trying to sell assets that have large cap gains um and we can essentially show someone how to sell a business for instance for 100 million and pay you know basically zero capital gains which is powerful if someone's making you know 100 million dollars and their capital gains is going to be well over 20 million dollars um <clears throat> but just to give some examples um so we'll do, uh, we, we like one where we use a strategy that is called private reinsurance. And really what is this about is during COVID, for the first time, business owners, the government can basically shut me down due to a virus and, and shut my business down, shut my revenue down. For instance, if you were in an import-export business, you weren't probably making any money during, during COVID, but you still have employees and payroll and whatnot. So they'll allow you to create, um, basically partner with a legit property and casualty commercial insurance company, create your own private insurance fund. So say you could put a million dollars into it. That's a million dollar tax deduction off your business income for that year. And why do they do that? Because if something like 2020, 2021 happened, you can dig into that million dollars to pay your employees to get you through, to keep you from going under because the government doesn't want businesses to tank. Like they need businesses to do well. It's good for the economy and it's good for their taxes. So they don't want us to, you know, not succeed. So that's one example of a way that we can create a seven figure deduction. That's pretty cool that we've done with a lot of our high end clients. Um, another example would be, um, we have some five to one strategies. They're really all different. Um, but basically, uh, without getting too much into specifics, and there's probably probably have five different ones that we recommend, but I'll share one that's really cool that I like. And I think once you hear it, you'll realize, okay, I see how that's a legit expense, business deduction. 
Um, so there's a company that created a medical product. Um, and basically when they were raising funding, they didn't raise enough and they didn't qualify for something with the FDA. Uh, I believe it was, but long story short, some tax attorneys basically restructured it to where it was a nonprofit to where they could receive donations and it would create it as a charitable contribution for the person donating the money, but it basically allowed this medical product to continue to be created and it's donated to really victims, you know, all over the world. Uh, like for instance, a lot of it's going to burn victims in Ukraine. So, um, but it's a legit charitable contribution. Uh, basically, in simplistic terms, you put a dollar in, you get a five dollar deduction. So, um, you know, obviously, we're dealing with larger amounts, more usually like more like a hundred thousand or so, but pretty straightforward. And the product is really incredible. It's doing great things for people all over the world. So, those are a couple examples of anywhere from six to seven figure deductions. So when you're working with your clients, what, what do you want them to understand? What are you trying to teach them so they can get it, so to speak? I want, number one, I want people to realize that there's the financial industry of CFP, stockbrokers, assets under management, all those people. There's the tax industry of CPAs and accountants, tax attorneys. But those industries are two separate industries. There's really not a bridge connected to them. So first and foremost, I want them to know that I'm the bridge. We're the bridge. We connect the two industries. We're trying to create efficiencies in both those industries, marry them together, and ultimately create significantly more wealth for our clients, which is really the big picture. Uh, it tax efficient wealth. Um, tax efficient assets, assets that are, you know, preferably untaxable. Um, Cause I always say, if you could wake up in a world one day when you're 60, 65, 70 years old and have zero taxable assets, would that be a good thing? And of course they say yes. So um, what I also want them to understand is I, I talked to a lot of, uh, of CFPs and stockbrokers. And so I'm talking to a guy who manages over $2 billion, very successful and it's the first time I've ever heard anybody say this to me and because we're, we're explaining what we do, how we can help his clients and his business with our tax planning. And he says, yeah, people don't realize CPAs don't do really do what CPAs do. In other words, like you think CPAs do all this, but they really don't. And I was like, you're the first person, number one, to ever say that. Number two, I love it. It's powerful. Um, and what does that mean? If you really think about it, 90% of the CPA accounting industry, they are paid to fill out tax returns with the state and the Fed. That is what their job is. They're, they're not paid to come up with creative strategies to help you mitigate taxes. They're just filling it out. And if you make a lot of money, you probably had this conversation with your client where the CPA says, here's what you owe. And the client says, well, is there anything else we can do? And the CPA says, you know, you're welcome to, figure stuff out, like research, run it by me, kind of thing like that. Like it's their job, not the CPAs, which is ironic. But really that's what they do. They're just filling out returns for the state and the Fed. That's it. So they're not doing high end mitigation. They're not creating six figure deductions typically. There are some, and you know, I call them unicorns because they're rare, but, um, but for the most part, it's important for people to understand that going back to the education piece, we want people to understand, number one, it's very important that your finances, your retirement, everything in that world that pertains to money is efficiently connected to your taxes. Number one. Number two, we want them to be properly educated that if you really understand taxes and you really understand where they're going in this country, that's the biggest wealth eroder that you have. There's nothing hurting you from creating more wealth than taxes. Promise you. Because you can talk to anybody who's successful that's been at it for 30, 40 years and figure out how much they've lost in taxes over the years. Um, and think, think about Social Security. Social Security is the biggest scam in the country, 
hundred percent. Our government is purposely crippling every normal American that's not already filthy rich. Purposely crippling them financially with that system. Because it doesn't it doesn't work. It's never going to give you back what you paid into it. You're never going to get anywhere close to it back. If you're young enough, you're probably never going to see it. They've already bumped the age farther out. I'm not planning on it. If it if I get something, I still the cake, but I'm not at all planning on that as far as my retirement portfolio goes. Um, the, what's crazy, if they took that money – and they put it in an investment for every individual American, every American that worked 30 to 40 years would have over a million dollars at retirement. That's what's crazy. Right. And, and the return on that investment wouldn't have to be high at all. Six percent. Yeah, yeah. Just a modest return. Five, yeah. six, seven percent. And they would hundred percent. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. I, I thought one of the things that you said was really interesting about you being the bridge. Cause that's something I see a lot is, um, everyone kind of has their specialty, so to speak, but there's not a lot of coordination. And I think people like you and me, uh, that's what we try to do is take a big picture approach. And we're not going to pretend to be an expert in every subject, but we have to account for everything in your financial picture. So to your point, we create efficiencies. Um, I like to bring up my experience being a strategy consultant working with Fortune 500 companies, and a lot of what I was doing is being the guy who was taking a big picture approach. Every team is kind of working almost independently. They naturally get kind of siloed. And just by looking at it big picture, you can create efficiencies among the different teams. And I think there's something very similar going on here where you have kind of siloed industries and they're all doing their thing, but you're the guy who's coming in and looking at it holistically and saying, how can we create a more efficient overall strategy, right? All right, 100%. Primarily pertaining to taxes or creating untaxable assets or we're, we're helping a client hold on to more of their money that normally would go to the government. Um, that's our primary thing because – you know, there's, there's just not a lot of people doing what we do, to be honest. Yeah. So I want to throw out something that we didn't talk about this before. So I'm going to blindside you a little bit, but I think you and I may have similar views on this. What if, because I see people like this who are making very good money. And so their solution to avoiding taxes or mitigating taxes, well, I'm just going to max out my retirement accounts. And, and you tell them, well, maybe you should look elsewhere. Like, well, no, because then if I, if I don't max out my retirement accounts, I'm going to pay more in taxes. What would you tell someone like that? Sure. Um, I have this conversation a lot, but it's a pretty simple conversation. And uh, I don't, we don't really have objections to it unless the client has one of the best, you know, employee matches known to man. I mean, there are a handful of companies out, out there that, that have incredible matches. They love their employees, obviously, but that's not the norm. The average person is getting around 3% usually uh, from their employer. So any good advisor, no matter what kind of advisor you are in the financial world, if you really care and you really know what you're doing, you're always going to encourage the client put in up to get your match, get that free money. You're, you'd be crazy not to where my wife works, the, uh, the CFO there, um, he's always blown away by the young people that don't even save him to the 403B account because it's a, it's a nonprofit. And it's just like, you know, he's blown away by it because they're missing out on free money. So that's what any good advisor should say um, to their clients is do that. And then anything else, let's put it somewhere else. Let's put it, even if it is an IRA, let's put it in an IRA that we have more control over. And when I go over uh, the our, the model that we use for a client, it has covers every financial decision a client would ever make, every, everywhere their money is, it covers it. When I get to the section of qualified money, which is a 401k, a SEP, um, IRAs, that kind of money, I put it in there. Oh, Mr. Client, you've got $200,000 in your 401k. And then I draw vertical lines on it. And the client's like, well, what's that for? I'm like, well, this is your 401k, but it's in prison. Well, what do you mean? Well, because your company that you work for and the government control that account. You don't control it. You don't have any say-so really over it for the most part. You can't get to it when you want to without penalty. Um, it's really not yours until you're 59 and a half. And then, or if you leave the company, then you can roll it into something else, but there's so many limitations on it. Plus 
it was not created for retirement income. It was created for accumulation. So another example, because everybody loves analogies and whatnot. And if you, you hire a Sherpa to climb Mount Everest and he gets you to the top and he's like, all right, I got you to the top. Peace out. Good luck getting down. And oh, by the way, more people die on the descent than the ascent of climbing a mountain. That's what you're doing with 401k because it wasn't created to create a distribution in retirement that's sustainable. And that's when we go back to, and I'm sure you've talked about this logo on your podcast, the 4% rule. Um, you know, if you're pulling out more than 4% from retirement accounts, you can Google it all you want. People a lot smarter than all of us have already figured out you're going to run out of money. So um, that's what I say to, to that is don't put all your eggs in that basket. And lastly, about deferring a tax, that's one of the most idiotic ways to think when it comes to taxes. Because <laughs> here's what you're really doing. You're saying, all right, I'm going to max out my 401k and defer all this tax. I'm not making a whole lot of money right now. I'm making, you know, $120,000, $150,000 a year. As you continue to do better in your career and make more money, now you're now you're in your 50s and you're making $400,000 a year. And you, you've had that same mindset. So now you're even in a higher tax bracket than you were. And you have that same mindset where you've just created this massive qualified pot of money. And then I'll say to the client, if it say it's a million dollars, not that that's a ton of money this day and age, but it's a million dollars, how much of that money is yours? And there, you'd be shocked. Some people think it's all theirs. Um, I've even had doctor clients that thought it was all theirs. Um, but in reality, no, it's like every time you pull a dollar out, about 30 cents is going to go to the government. That's what's happening. Is you you got it your biggest nest egg that's really controlled by the government. That's never a good thing. You don't want that. We want it as little of government control in our lives as possible if we're smart. So, but really what I tell people is when you do that deferred uh, contribution into your 401k, really what you're doing is you're kicking a can down the road that's inevitably going to be a bigger can. What does that mean? A bigger tax. And then I'll circle back around and I say, hey, do you think taxes are going to go up or down in this country by the time you get to retirement? And unless your head has been in the sand, any person with sense is going to say they have to go up. Our government prints money like it grows on a tree. It has to go up. So what happens if we're, we end up like Europe and it's a 50% flat tax? What happens if you wake up one day at 65, you've saved up $3 million dollars and everything changes and you, you find out half of your nest egg is the governance. That's all I have to say about that. Yeah, there's, there's so much we could go into there. Um, you probably are aware of this, but there are companies now where by default, your money is contributed to a retirement account. You have to actually opt out. What a great deal for the financial institutions. They get your money by default. You don't even get to choose. I mean, you do, but it's, it's like if you don't tell them, please do not take my money, they take your money and put it in a retirement account, right? You have to actually opt out of it, right? So th th there's so much we could talk about with retirement accounts. But I think you brought up a, a really good point, which is control, right? Uh, control. Put aside you know, everything else, return on investment and all the other metrics people like to think about. You want your capital under your own control. And money in a retirement account, even if it gets you a nice return and it grows into a nice nest egg, that money isn't really under your control. And one of the things that I've found, Chris, is that um, a lot of the strategies I propose give people more control over their capital. But you know what? A lot of people don't want that. Because a lot of people, they don't want the responsibility that comes with having control over their capital, and they would rather outsource that decision-making and all of that to somebody else. And uh, so, yeah, I think, I think it, it... That's why they need people like you in their lives, to do it for them. Yeah, well, and also you point out, when you put your money in a retirement account, it's not a tax deduction. It's a tax deferral. It's kicking the can down the road. Would you rather be taxed on the seed or on the harvest. Right? If you get if you take that tax hit today, you're being taxed on a contribution, which whatever it is, 
is going to be a lot less, hopefully, than what that nest egg grows into, right? Mm -hmm. If you put your money in a retirement account now, what happens is, as I'm sure you're aware, in many scenarios, even if tax rates don't go up, you're going to be taxed at a higher rate just because there's going to be more money there, right? Um, 100%. So yeah. Plus, the other thing I don't like about it, especially for a young person, is you're basically giving up on your dreams, right? When I when I first started earning money as a full-time employee, I wanted to retire tomorrow, right? But you're telling me if I put my money in a 401k, I'm automatically giving up on that dream psychologically. I'm saying I'm never going to be able to retire until age 59 and a half at the earliest, right? That's psychologically a pretty tough pill to swallow when you're right out of college, right? Like don't kill my dreams right away. But Yeah. But, in reality, uh, while you're young and not making a lot, you should be saving in a Roth or a Roth-like investment um, every year that you're able to. Because eventually, if you're going to be successful, which is, you know, make a husband and wife make a little over 200000 they can't put in a Roth. Your only option is a backdoor Roth. So um, at minimum, you should be doing that. Also, if your company offers a Roth, 401k option you should switch to that um it, i'm just I, I promise you there's not a single person in the history of america that woke up at 65 70 years old and had millions of dollars that was untaxable and complained about it ever so yeah but i say roth like because there are alternative strategies that are just like roths most people don't realize the original roth um chassis was actually supposed to be whole life but as you know, hopefully most of us are aware, and at least you and I are aware, you know, Wall Street has its hands in everything, has a lot of control and power. And so they somehow convinced the creator of the Roth to basically use traditional funds and securities. Yeah. So. Yeah. 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 Liquidity, access, and control. Those are the three things you want with any. Uh, financial vehicle, but they always try to reduce it to return on investment. Right. Um, and of course they can't guarantee you any return on investment. Um, right. But nonetheless, they tout it like it's like it's a fact that it's just going to go up, I don't know, 12% per year, whatever number they throw out there, which they can never prove, of course. Um, so, you know, the last thing I'll ask you, Chris, is um, what, what got you into the business? Like, what are you passionate about? Why do you do what you do? Yeah, um, I'm in general a passionate person, whether it's about my business, about my family, my sports team, uh, my faith. Um, it's who I am uh, as a person. So whenever, anytime I'm talking about something I'm passionate about, I can't really contain it. Um, it is evident that I'm passionate about it. Uh, I believe we really help people. I believe that we put people in a better position than they were before they met us. I believe they're better educated than they were before they met us. And I believe that they're saving significantly more taxes than they were before they met us. So those are all things that I think are good. They're good for the client. So uh, I recently heard, um, I think his name is Jeff Henderson. He's a Forbes top 20 speaker. Uh, his background is in marketing. So like he was the, he was sort of the guy that came up with the idea of the little stuffed animal Chick-fil-A cows that get dropped down from parachutes in Mercedes Benz, or it used to be, the dome. He actually was one of the guys that came up with that idea because genius idea, obviously. Um, and it's cool. Um, but he has this whole thing about four, you know, are you for your team, you know, your staff, your partners, are you for your customer and are you for yourself? Cause you're really only as good as a healthy you. And I love it because when I heard him speak, I'm like, I was, I was so in sync with everything he was saying because like, we're for our people. We're for our clients so much. Like we, we really do life with our clients. Most of our clients are become lifelong friends because that's just the kind of people we are. We, we deeply care and we're very relational. Like we aren't just trying to have a transactional relationship with our clients. Like a traditional advisor does. Let's just be honest. They're product salesmen. They're not traditional. Don't don't right. use that word traditional. There's nothing traditional about the way the modern financial system works. I'm sorry, I had to cut you off there. Right. Well, <laughs> it's not it's old, not traditional. Traditional is a good school, word. The old school yeah. advisor, the way they are, it's just it's just a they're just product salesmen, and it's just a transaction, transactional relationship for the most part. Sure, there's some 
people out there that are different, but I know a lot of advisors, um, stock mm-hmm. brokers, why not? So I know how they, how they tick, um, what they're about. Um, but yeah, so for me, um, I got out of college during the lovely crash of 08, 09. Um, not a whole lot of job opportunities then. Um, so at the time I knew, I always knew I needed to do something working with people and in sales. I kind of knew like, overall what my strengths were and basically i think i was doing some kind of data analyst job and my dad was like you you come work with me but you eat what you kill so you know that's kind of where it started and thankfully at the time i didn't have a lot of expenses and you know just newly married but didn't need a ton of money and so i was able to be patient and grow the business um but what i did was i studied self-made millionaires when I got into the business almost, you know, 13 to 15 years ago, something like that. And I realized that the majority of them create their wealth not in the stock market, but in two areas primarily. They invested in businesses either for themselves or with partners and they invested in real estate. So I knew going forward, all right, if I'm going to be in this financial industry as a whole, those are the, that's a tried and proven way to create wealth. And so obviously my primary, most of my clients are business owners. So they're already doing that. And then we, and we do love real estate and we think that there's a way to create units and using certain types of products. Um, like we sort of alluded to, they can allow people to do all of that. Um, and so that's, that's sort of who we are, but that's what, what we drive our clients to do. Let's create tax efficiencies Let's save as much money as we can tax wise. Oh, we just saved a hundred thousand. Now we have a hundred thousand to invest. What is the most efficient way to invest this money to where ultimately it ends up preferably in some type of real estate portfolio. Um, and my clients love that because there's, you know, everybody wants to invest in real estate. I think most people just don't know how to, they don't know how to get started. So, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my why. So. Awesome, Chris. Well, uh, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. I'm sure we'll we'll talk again in the future. But uh, this was uh, Chris Miller, everyone. High-end tax mitigation strategies. You heard it from the man. And uh, Chris, thanks so much for your time. Greatly appreciate it. Thanks, Logan. Have a good day.